Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our next virtual event with Nika Ray and Peter Trachtenberg here to discuss Nika's memoir, Ray by Ray, A Daughter's Take on the Legend Nicholas Ray. Welcome, everyone. We're so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this time. Um, especially since everyone's so isolated, it's nice to be able to still come together this way. So thank you for joining us. Um, we'll be hosting many more events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website at booksoup.com, as well as our social media at booksoup. Our next event is actually this Thursday, June 26th at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with Neil Pollock and Anna David discussing Neil's memoir, Pothead, My Life as a Marijuana Addict in the Age of Legal Weed. So for regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter, which you can do on our website. This evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, just hit the Like button and it'll bump them up. And we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And you can also um, support our bookstore and authors by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, which you can see with the green button also at the bottom of the screen. And it'll take you um, directly to our website in another, in another window where you can continue your checkout process. And we're also selling digital audio books through Libro FM and Kobo for those who prefer audiobooks. And with that said, let me introduce our guest speakers for this evening. Nika Ray was raised in Los Angeles, not far from where scenes from her father's most famous film, Rebel Without a Cause, were shot. In her early teen years, she became heavily involved in the LA punk scene and spent a decade mimicking her father through drug and alcohol abuse. After becoming sober in her early 20s, she moved to New York City, where she still lives. At 38, she graduated from New School University, writing and directing two films and creating and staging several plays. She has spent the years since researching and interviewing friends and family of her father, including Wim Wenders, Dennis Hopper, Norman Lloyd, Tony Ray, and many more. Her research is the basis of Ray by Ray. Peter Trachtenberg is the author of the memoir, Seven Tattoos, The Book of Calamities, Five Questions About Suffering and Its Meaning, and Another Insane Devotion, a book about the search for a missing cat that's also an encoded exploration of love and meaning. His essays, journalism, and short fiction have been published in The New Yorker, Harper's, Bomb, Triquarterly, O, The New York Times Travel Magazine, and A Public Space. His commentaries have been broadcast on NPR's All Things Considered. And our host this evening, Peter Karlafis, is a New York-based editor and author. He is editor of three short story collections in the Have a New York City Noir series and published four other mystery noir collections, including the Anthony Award winning anthology, The Obama Inheritance, 15 Stories of Conspiracy Noir. He is also author of two poetry collections and two play collections. He is co-director of Three Rooms Press, which published tonight's book, and he lives in New York City. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to our guest this evening. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Sam. Um, I guess I wanted to hold up the book. This is it, Ray by Ray. Uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we were very fortunate, Nika, on Friday night to have it appear on screen on TCM, right? Yes. That was exciting. Um, it was really <laughs> exciting to have uh, right there, you know, Ben Ben Mankiewicz, a Hollywood uh, boy himself, uh, holding up the book just like I am now on TCM and we uh, screened uh, Rebel Without a Cause. So I thought that was uh, brilliant for us. And uh, it also appeared on screen. It appeared on their web page. So we're very fortunate to have had that happen. We, you got You were in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, another I was. Big coup for us, and now you're at Book Soup in Hollywood. So what? I mean, it, this is a dream come true. The the only thing that might have been better is if we were really there together tonight, you know, in person. Uh, but uh, which was the plan? But uh, life changes, and you know, we, we it's just not happening. So, but you are happening, and 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 you were happening with this idea for this book for so many years. Yeah, you did so much work. Uh, he brought it to us at Three Rooms Press, and uh, we worked uh, very hard together, and, and I thought we did a magnificent job because you had done a magnificent job to begin with. And, uh, you know, and, and we were able to add so many facets 
to the book from there, uh, working together. And uh, it's just been a great experience uh, for the press, for me. For me. Uh, yeah, it's been wonderful. So uh, why don't you uh, read for the book while uh, everyone uh, that's watching uh, decides to press the green button right here. See that button? Where's my hand? Here it is. Right See that button right there? <laughs> yeah. Press that green button. Right there. And a copy of Ray by Ray. <laughs> and I think uh, Nika's going to read for the book, and then we'll bring Peter back, and uh, you guys will talk about uh, In a Lonely Place, and I'm sure some other things. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. It means so much to me that you're here. And I'm gonna read from Ray by Ray um, from the opening chapter. Please allow me to introduce myself. I am the youngest child of the film director, Nicholas Ray, best known for directing James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. After his death in 1979, when I was 17, People who I met at the clubs around Hollywood called me a rebel with a cause. I didn't know what they were talking about. I hadn't seen my father's movie. The only cause I had at that time in my life was to get wasted. I come from a long line of alcoholics and drug addicts. Aside from alcohol, speed was the drug of choice amongst us. Although I did dabble in heroin, I was squeamish with needles and blood. And so I never made it to full on junkiedom. My father, Nick, was notorious for carrying a doctor's bag full of pharmaceuticals during the height of his career, directing 20 movies, not including the films he doctored while under contract at RKO in 16 years. By the time I was born, his illustrious career was on the skids. A doctor had prescribed methamphetamine to treat his alcoholism, and a nurse was coming to the house to shoot him up. At the same time, my mother, Betty, his third wife, was ingesting Preludin, an amphetamine that made her mind spin around in circles so quickly she could barely move. After Betty left Nick, she got off the Preludin, but continued popping the caffeine tablets, Vibrant and Nodos like candy. I was five years old and standing in the small living room of the house my mother had called a shack when it became clear to me that I had to have a strong sense of self before achieving success. Otherwise, I'd become my parents. This is the first clear memory I have of childhood. When Nick came to visit us 10 years after my parents' separation, he brought along his drug dealer who always carried with him the best Bolivian and Peruvian flake. Not that I knew what cocaine was at the time, hell, I didn't even know what the tiny silver spoon was that my father had dropped on our living room carpet. When I'd asked my older sister what it was, she looked at me like I was from Mars and said, Coke, Nika, Coke. I started my love affair with speed when I was 12. First, I tried white crosses, pills that resemble an aspirin tablet but do much more than kill the pain. I graduated to their bigger sister, the time-released Black Beauty, by the time I was 14. Two years later, I was snorting cocaine practically every day. It was not a problem getting my hands on it. I'd started going to clubs on the Sunset Strip when I was 15. There were always men willing to give a pretty girl drugs. I loved alcohol just as much as I loved speed and would put myself in the same precarious situations to get my hands on another drink that I would to get another line of Coke. By the time I was of age, by the time I was of age, I was sober, so I never took a legal drink and therefore had to scam for drinks just as hard as I had to scam for drugs. Another family trait I shared was mixing alcohol and speed. The two just seemed to go hand in hand. Mixing cocaine and liquor really did the trick though. The Coke kept me from getting messy. Without it, I was a falling down disaster. Nick, once a Hollywood golden boy championed by the producer John Houseman and the director Elia Kazan became a fall down drunk in his later years. The doctor who had prescribed him the methamphetamine believed the speed would keep the alcohol from destroying Nick. It only added to his mania. I knew nothing about Nick's mania until I was in my 40s and started on this search to find out about my father's career and life the reason for my parents' separation and eventual divorce, 
and ultimately to learn what kind of a man Nicholas Ray was. And so doing, I hope to come to a better understanding of myself. When I looked into the mirror, there was always a hole where my father was supposed to be. I could see my mother in me because I had grown up with her, but I had not grown up with my father. In fact, I'd only seen him a handful of times and I was always left with an emptiness, a not knowing. And I needed to know what parts of me came from him because I was his namesake. I had been making attempts to shape my life in his image since I was a teenager, running through my high school from cops with their guns drawn, the troublemaker, rebel, nonconformist. I'd gone to many bookstores and stood in the film book aisle reading about what a renegade Nicholas Ray was, reading how he understood the misunderstood, reading about his kinship with the troubled teen. That was me, the troubled teen. He had been one too. He'd been kicked out of high school 16 times after his father died. After Nick died, I dove into a punk rock lifestyle that at first saved me. In the late 1970s, it was the only place where it was okay to be an angry girl. The anger I had been feeling since Betty married a second time, putting my sister and I into danger and leaving us both the victim of violent rages and incest amplified after my father's death. I met girls who were angry like me, girls who understood. I cut off all my hair. I dressed in black with chains and spikes. I spent my night slam dancing. We didn't call it moshing then in the pit to bands like Black Flag, The Adolescents, and The Circle Jerks. In the mornings, my friends and I would count our bruises like they were badges of honor. We didn't live at home with our parents. We couldn't get jobs because of the way we looked or keep them because we couldn't wake up in time. We spent the money we earned panhandling on Black Beauties and Thunderbird wine or old English 40 ounces instead of food and eventually I got sick with hepatitis. Nick's mother always came to his financial rescue, and his three older sisters were always there to help him pick up the pieces. Nick would never risk actual homelessness, not even later in his drug-addled life. He had directed the masterpiece, Rebel Without a Cause, and that was the calling card that would always be his savior. I had no such calling card to save me. Everyone in my family was always scrambling to save themselves. I have one full-blooded sister, Julie, and two half-brothers, Tony and Tim. Tony is Nick's son from his first marriage to the writer, Jean Evans. Tim is Nick's son with his second wife, the actress, Gloria Graham. If you're a film buff, you may recognize her as Ginny Tremaine in Crossfire, Violet Bick in It's a Wonderful Life or as Rosemary Bartlow in The Bad and the Beautiful. If you aren't a film buff, but you are big on Hollywood scandals of the 1950s, you've probably heard about Gloria Graham marrying Nick Ray's first son, Tony, eight years after she divorced Nick. And if you haven't heard, I'm here to tell you. For me, Tony and Gloria's marriage signified that relationship norms weren't upheld in our family. The Rays had their own ethics. Navigating through them as a kid nearly killed me. Thank you. That's great. <clears throat> oh, that was great, Nika. That was beautiful. Thank you. Well, one <laughs> of the things that, you know, this brings up for me, and it's something I think that I said in my blurb, is that your book is really a palimpsest in the sense that you always see both your own, you see your, your life layered over your father's life. Um, so that there, there, are always, there are all these coincidences and echoes, even though you didn't really know him or knew him only briefly. Um, which made me also want to talk about the movie, what I think is his great movie in a lonely place. It's certainly not as well known as Rebel. And if you want to talk about one of Gloria Graham's amazing performances, it's his Laurel Gray in that movie, which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk, start by talking about the ways in which that movie was and wasn't autobiographical. I mean, I understand, for example, that the apartment in which the protagonist, Dixon Steele, lives is modeled after an apartment that, that Nick lived in when he first came to Hollywood or earlier yeah. on. Yes. 
It was, okay. um, I believe it was the apartment he lived in when he was uh, doing a tree, a tree lives in Brooklyn. He was the second assistant director um, on Elia Kazan's first movie. And I believe he lived in that apartment building then. Yeah. And he also ended up, I mean, while he was making the movie, he and Gloria were splitting up. I mean, it was on the DL um, because they didn't want the news to get out. But at a certain point, he started sleeping on set. Right. Yeah. And he would just tell um, the executives that it was too far a drive out to Malibu. They lived in Malibu on um, Colony Road, I believe, um, right outside of the Malibu Colony. But yeah, he, he, he would just tell them he didn't want to go home because it was too far of a drive. And yeah. Well, I'm wondering if there are things, I mean, because you, if there are other things in the movie that you can see your father in. I mean, I'll just quickly give a recap of this story for people who haven't seen it. It's a story of this charismatic, but burnt, washed out, washed up screenwriter named Dixon Steele is played by Humphrey Bogart, who was 50 at the time he made it. And he's somebody who, you know, is too good for the work. At one point, he bitterly says, you know, we're, we're just popcorn salesmen. Right. Um, early on, he becomes the suspect in a murder, murder of a young woman. And, you know, part of it is you real, he, it is left ambiguous as to whether he may in fact be guilty of a murder. You learn that he is guilty. Uh, he has an entire history of violence toward men and women, including a, a former girlfriend. Um, and then gradually, um, Laurel Gray, uh, the Glory Graham character, who at first is the love interest, becomes the protagonist. And you start seeing him through her eyes and you begin to become afraid of him or understand why she's afraid of him. It's something that I had never seen in a movie before where one, a character sort of shifts position. Uh -huh. So I'm wondering if you can talk about how, in what way does that echo your father's life and in what ways did you get intimations of it in your in your own um, life with him? And also you're you're re retracing his path. Well, I think that I was um, first made aware that um, this was a very personal uh, film for my father and 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 um, when I interviewed Ga the writer Gavin Lambert, who um, lived with my father at the Chateau Marmont um, in 1956, right after Rebel, and um, he told me of an encounter with my father when they first met, and my father uh, said that uh, Dixon Steele wasn't Humphrey Bogart, it was him. Mm. That, uh, that uh, he only had the choice of either he would go and kill himself or, or get help. Um, he couldn't, I don't, I don't know that just like Dixon Steele, I don't, know that my father was able to control his impulses, um, mm -hmm. whether, whether that was um, his gambling addiction, which he was notorious for, um, and or his uh, alcohol consumption or drug use, and his treatment of women was um, really, really bad. In fact, I remember when I was doing research and I came across uh, the newspaper clipping of, of uh, Gloria Graham uh, uh, asking for a divorce and her, and her claim was cruelty. And I found the same um, in my mom's papers that you know they wanted the divorce because of cruelty. And um, when I, spoke to uh, my father's first son, my half-brother, Tony. Um, 
he 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 lived with them during the summer and he recounted uh brutal you know knockdown fights like just they just fought and but um from what i gathered gloria liked that part of mm. the relationship too and she would um antagonize you know she was antagonistic but um so so when i watched the movie for the first time having had gavin lambert give me this information i um i looked at dixon steel to tell me about my father mm -hmm. you know? And, and, you know, and I had, you know, Dixon Steele is paranoid. He, um, my dad was paranoid. He, um, I remember I, I talked to David Thompson um, about my father and he, he um, mentioned that my father was never one of them. He, he always, he was always kind of on the outside. He did things differently. Like when he would direct movies, he would say, you know, like an actor would be crossing the street and he'd be like, why are you crossing the street? What's your motivation? And these actors were like, I'm just here to hit my marks. You know, <clears throat> like get the camera going and I'm here to go from point A to point B. What What's this nonsense? And, and like every moment my father took, seriously and it, and it kind of bothered people so um so he was always suspect just like dixon steel um in in a lonely place is is um not happy being a popcorn salesman yeah well there's this kind of perfectionism but it's a perfectionism that can never i mean given the the makeup of the industry the way it works it is impossible for a screenwriter to, to reach perfection. It's like a right. screenwriter who wants to be an artist might as well shoot himself. Right. Know, you know, and that was probably the same for a director. Right, it was, um, I had this quote from Curtis Hansen. Um, I can't find it now. Curtis Hansen, um, the director, who unfortunately passed away he um i found it he uh used in a lonely place as a model for his actors in la confidential the award-winning film um to get an idea of what hollywood was like at the time period of in a Pl lonely place and so um when i interviewed him i was fortunate enough to interview him um and I had no idea at the time, just um, but he was, and um, rest in, in peace, Curtis Hansen, you were a dear friend to me. Anyway, so he said about the popcorn uh, salesman and movie making, he said, um, the world has changed from Nick and you know the business has changed in some ways and yet it's always changing. And you know what's funny is that you think about In a Lonely Place and the struggle between the artist and the business and it's never been expressed better than that. When it's good, even in the world of the independent movies, the so-called independent movies today, there is such a desire to be successful that that scene in the bar where he's hitting, He's sitting there with the director and the dialogue about being the popcorn salesman and so forth. That's the same deal today. As much as things have changed, it's not been expressed better than that. And it never will. I mean, as much as it changes, it will never change completely because if you don't sell the popcorn, then you don't get to make another movie. And the directors who have a body of work manage to have a successful movie often enough to keep going or else they don't keep going. Yeah, that's it. It's a great way of putting it. Right. So if you're an artist and you you want to express yourself in a way that isn't the conventional form, what do you do? And people get exasperated with you. 
It's, it's really interesting because I look at the movie, my primary way of looking at the movie is as a love, as a love story or a mm. story of a love, a love that goes bad. But it is really also very, it's really interesting about the relationship between love or what passes for love and success or some version of success. I mean, one of the things that, happen is that happens is when he gets involved with the Gloria Graham character, at least early on, she um, inspires him and he starts writing. And he starts writing a screenplay based on this book that you've seen him just snickering at. I mean, not even having the patience to read in, in the first act. Um, and he turns it into something else. And at a certain point when she's about to leave him, um, his agent desperately says, well, let me get his, his, the script to, the, to this producer because if he likes the script, if he has success, he can, he can withstand losing you. And right. it turns out that the this, this script that he wrote from a book that he had nothing but contempt for turns out to be great. Right. And, and even his agent is uh, surprised that the producer likes it, but it's because of Gloria's inspiration. She's like his muse. And that's a common theme in, in my father's films is how love will save the man. Love can save him. And yet not permanently. I mean, that's the, what's incredibly realistic in this movie. It is one of the best portrayals I've seen of an abusive relationship. As I was saying earlier, most of the Hollywood movies that I've seen about abusive, it's usually an abusive guy, um, a, a boyfriend or a husband. You are never with the guy. You're always, you're, you're, the point of view is always the woman's. Uh, mm -hmm. The man is, is, is somebody who you feel cre creepy about. You're waiting for her to like sort of snap out of it. But here, mm -hmm. you know, for the first half of the film, you're, you are seeing things through Dix's eyes. And it's only in the second half that you start to see things through her eyes. And the result is that even as that behavior surfaces, you feel sick. You feel sick in the way that you would if you saw somebody who you liked behaving horribly. There's part of you, you, don't, you want to warn her, but you also want to tell him, shape up, man, snap out yeah. of it, do better. Well, yeah, you, you, um, you have sympathy for, for his character, even though he's so volatile. And my, my father was, was a master at that, you know, of that duality, dealing with that duality in, in mankind. You know, we're always grappling with different parts of our side, ourselves, you know, and um, uh, which brings me to the violence in his mm -hmm. movie and a quote he in a in a interview he did with uh charles beach for the cast cahiers du cinema uh charles beach asked him about um the characters in his movies being so violent and nick my dad said absolutely there is violence inside them there is in each of us it is in there it is they are in potential. The bank cashier leading a peaceful life counts his wads of notes and begins to read everybody. Counts his notes and suddenly he seizes the gun, he keeps to guard his till, goes out into the street and shoots a dozen people. That's why I like nonconformists. The nonconformist is much saner than the person who all his life carries on in his everyday way because he's the one most likely at the most unexpected moment to explode and kill the first person who comes along, which remind, which brings me to, you know, the, the coach that girl that's murdered mm -hmm. by her boyfriend. And they're just normal. They're just like a plain, you know, white bread couple, you know, and, and the contrast between Gloria Graham, Laurel Gray, and the coat check girl, it's like, okay, these, like you see, you see uh, her with Gloria and, and you know, oh my God, of course, like this, Gloria is just dynamic. I mean, yes. what, you know, and same with Dick Steele, same with Humphrey Bogart. These two people, Gloria, uh, Dixon Steele and Laurel Gray, they're not like everybody. But it's the boyfriend 
the plain white bread boyfriend who like you would look at and you would think, oh, he's not going to hurt a fly. And they actually do. Well, he, you know, the, the police are like, well, he's, he's not going to do that. He doesn't have a history of exploding on people like Dick Steele. And indeed it is, it is that conformist who kills his girlfriend. So, so there you go, you know? Yeah, that's, that's really good. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I noticed in the movie is although Dick Steele is, has, is, is violent, it's like he is always forgiven for his violence. In fact, very early on, you know, he's approached by a former girlfriend who's trying to get him back to come back home with her. And you later learn that he broke her jaw or broke <laughs> her, her nose. And at one point she said, you know, he said, she says, well, you weren't nice to me, but you were nice. Well, you know, and there you go, like the the, the uh, commonality between this character and my dad's character and the women involved in my dad's. My mom never let my dad go and he destroyed her, which I write about at, at length in, in my book in detail, um, you know, and she could not get over him. And, um, and his first wife, Jean, Tony said that she never had another relationship after my father, like oh, wow. she never got over him either. And, you know, of course Gloria did because like maybe like with Gloria, my dad met his match, you know, yeah. like, and, and you know, in, in, at the time they were married, she was the one paying the bills. You know, when they met, she was the one that had already uh, been nominated for Best Supporting Actress for a role in Crossfire. You know, he was just, he was just beginning. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow, yeah. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, and, and like, you know, what? Well, I know that, you know, from, from the book, reading the book, that your father was able to show up 10 years after he had left and your mom took him in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, she didn't, she, she got sick of his shit, you know, pretty soon. Um, she, she uh, you know, uh, realized that he, he was up to the same old tricks. You know, he wasn't going to change. Um, but yeah, in the beginning, she had that hope that we could all be a family again, you know, and then he shows up in his leopard print bikini <laughs> with his drug dealer in tow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a kind of a family, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, but yeah. But, um, you know, I wanted to share too in, um, Charles Beach always asked my always also said to my father in your in your films this theme of violence is always closely linked to solitude mm -hmm. and my dad said for everything i have written and was closely involved in my personal trademark has always been i'm a stranger here myself um the quest for a fulfilled life is i think paradoxically solitary i also believe that solitude is very important for man so long as it does not harm him if he knows how to use it originally as. And then he goes, this is a very personal feeling. It's too difficult to talk about. And and I read that again uh, this afternoon after um, watching In a Lonely Place again. And, and I thought about how solitary Dixon Steele is, how solitary uh, Laurel Gray is. You know, there there are these people who are are very much alone. You know, and yeah. go on. Well, it's the end of the movie. Sees them both going back to loneliness. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's it, just this walk away from the camera that he takes down through the courtyard of the apartment. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh, it's it's just. It's yeah, it's it's totally wrenching. It's like, no, he didn't do it. Take him back, please. 
you know, and they reshot the ending. That was the ending that like my, my father wanted and the studio wanted more of a, you know, ni nicely, you know, let's tie it up in a nice bow. And he, um, you know, got, got the actors to, to stay later at night and and film and he got the crew to film uh the ending that we see today and and man would it have lost its oomph if if they had tied it up in a nice little bow to make the audiences happy you know well then the or original ending he was supposed to be innocent of the first killing but to kill laurel gray <laughs> um and that would be a kind of you know, it'd be a very pat kind of irony. But this is a much more realistic and also genuinely heartbreaking. I mean, if he kills her, he, lo he loses whatever sympathy you might have. Right, but, right. You know, he loses that duality, that humanness. He just becomes a killer. Yeah, you know? just a killer. And this, you see his potential for it. He comes close to, I mean, he, he is ch half choking her at the end. Yeah. Yeah. But he also sees himself. He has a moment where he recognizes himself. And that's what, what enables him to walk away. Yeah. And, you know, that that's in contrast with, you know, my, my father did that. I don't, I think that my, my father was insightful. You know, I, um, I, I, came to an understanding and a, and a realization through, you know, my research and the interviews and, and sitting with the material and with the story and, and um, that, that he did have regret, you know, he did have regret. He wasn't like this cold hearted person who just, just, you know, destroyed people's lives and, and um, it, he wasn't a good person, you know, um, but uh, he, he had regret and he walked away. It's like, you know, he, he told my mom, there's, I'm, I should, I cannot be a, a father. And, and it was decided like when my parents separated in 1964 and my mom, we were living in Madrid and my mom, brought my sister and I uh, to LA and um, they decided that it was best that he not be a part of our lives. And it was a decision that both of them regretted making later on. You know, yeah. it's, it's, that it's better to have a bad father than no father, you know, but hey man, if I'd had a known who he was and he'd been around, I would never have written this book and, and gotten to know um, what a tremendous life he had. I mean, tremendous, the, the, um, and his contribution to film history. And, you know, let's, let's hope that he is never forgotten. You know, let's hope that younger people you know, will see his movies like Turner Classic Movies screen three the other night. Um, and, you know, because, you know, Janine Bassinger, the film scholar, uh, she was like, nobody makes a film like Nicholas Ray. And I don't, mm. I can't tell you how many people told me that in, in this. Nobody makes a film like Nick, Nicholas Ray. He, creates a world he creates a world he also has this sense i mean you understand i mean it's sort of if rebel without a cause were re-released today it'd be real interesting to see how how young people how teenagers responded to it because what he understands is just what it feels like to be boiling with feeling that doesn't have a place to go right um and that is unacknowledged by the grown-ups around you or by the people around you I mean, in some ways, Dick Steele and Laurel Gray are both adolescents. They have this immensity of feeling inside them um, that, you know, in his case, um, prompts him to write screenplays, but it's also nobody else has it. Right. Right. You know, 
I'm wondering if you can talk about the ways in which you're like your father. <laughs> well, um, I'm more a poet than a journalist. Mm -hmm. My dad was a poet, you know, the poet of nightfall. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I have a fierce independent streak. Um, and I have allowed uh, self-doubt to interfere with that independent streak. Um, and hopefully, I can just listen to my own voice and listen to the way that I see things and articulate things and know that that's okay, that that's, that's my voice. I have a voice and yeah. it's mine. Um, it's nobody else's. And I um, fought hard for that voice. And, and I, I believe my dad struggled to um, maintain his independent spirit. Um, you know, if he had been born when I was born and uh, we as a society were like, he was born like, too soon in a way, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think about, like, I think about him and if he was born in, in this day, in this culture with this awareness, um, maybe he would have gotten some help and, and maybe he wouldn't have had to take himself down, you know, and, and um, you know, I, I know that destructive streak Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm fortunate that I um, got a grip on it at a young age and, and got sober and was able to lay down a foundation for myself. Um, you know, uh, I think that... Um, I'm insightful like him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know that I'm a visual genius like he is. I think my sister is. My sister's a visual genius, but I am I'm definitely attracted to visual geniuses. As you can see, if you can see yeah. things behind me, you know. Um, and uh yeah. I don't know. I don't know how else. That's enough. Okay. It's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. I um I was one more thing like um that Curtis uh talked about Bogart's casting in this movie. And this was the second film that my uh, father directed Bogart in. And um, the first one was Knock on Any Door uh, starring Bogart and John Derrick. And um, it was the first for Bogart's production company, Santana Films. And it made, it did well enough at the box office that um, it, it, it got, um, it kept, Santana films in business. And so In a Lonely Place was, I, I believe it was the third film um, in for Santana, but it was the second film for him and my dad. And, um, and Bo Bogart broke away from his normal character. Um, and Curtis said, 
The movie was not financially successful and the day it was made because it's not fun, it's very dark and it has the darkest possible ending in a way. And it's not Bogart the way people like to experience him. So definitely the flip side of that. And that's part of what's so good about it. And again, it gets back to that theme that I was trying to talk about in terms of illusion versus reality. You know, it's like looking in the mirror and which Bogart are you seeing? Are you seeing the Bogart that a person that you think of in certain kinds of movies or are you seeing the real man, which is which? Where does one start and where does the other leave off? In this movie, one feels that you are seeing very much the real Bogart that you haven't seen before. Is it true? I don't know, but you can feel the truth. And it feels like a very brave thing for a movie star to have done. Mm. Louise Brooks actually wrote that this was the real, the closest to what Bogart was really like. I think she said the loneliness, the selfishness, the bursts of violence. You know, that's, that's interesting. Um, and it's interesting um, that, you know, Dixon Steele, is Humphrey Bogart and he's also my father and it must it, you know when I think about like how my my dad was known to really get to know his actors he spent time with them off the set you know and 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 I and I wish there had been documented conversations they also Gloria and and Nick also lived close to uh, Bogart and Bacall in Malibu and they would go sailing Mm. Um, together um but you know in a lonely place is is a masterpiece it's one it's my dad's masterpiece um as is rebel without a cause and my father and james dean were very much alike yeah very, very much alike and it, it's it's interesting that his two masterpieces are the lead actors, the stars are personally like my father, but in the film also portraying parts of my father's character, you know, and, and in a, in a sense, um, well, you know, there's that quote where my dad said, it's too personal for me to talk about. And he didn't talk in depth from what I, from what I understand about what was going on um, emotionally. He, he, he told us, he told us what, what he was grappling with in his movies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, his characters are, are flayed open. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, his his movies are really operatic in the sense that, you know, that in opera people express themselves, they express their true feeling in song. And yeah. here it's through these extravagant wild gestures, often that are very self-destructive. Right. Yeah, you're right. Ah, you know, yeah. the, when, when, um, they're driving through the canyon and he cuts off that other driver and yeah. those two cars it is. It's like the collision. And you could you could hear like, yes, it, you're right. It's like the gestures are so melodramatic. And I hadn't even thought of that before. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it something that we could be sitting here in, in 2020 talking about a movie that was made in 1950? Yeah. You know, I mean, even before, even before I was born, that's like, oh my God, not before you were born, <laughs> but no, I mean, like, you, you know, who, who, who does that? There, who does, who makes movies that resonate on such a human level, you know, what six, is it 60, 70 years? 70 years. It's after. 70 years. It's 70. 70 years old. Yeah. yeah. You know, go dad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know. <laughs> what else? 
Wow. It would be amazing if, he, I mean, it would be so great if he were, a, it's like, I wish he were making movies now. He could be making movies, for example, about what is going on for young people in the street now. Oh my God, he would love that. And I yeah. could see him with his friggin' iPhone making yeah. like, I, I mean, I think that he would just be blown away by the whole, like, you can make a little movie on your iPhone and then go home and work on, you know? You could be totally independent. You could really, I mean, it is to be, an, I mean, it is horrible to be a filmmaker. It is, you always need money. But well, in no, uh, no previous time in history um, have people had access to technology. I mean, you can have, like, uh, maybe $5,000 and have all the technology you need to make a movie. True. Yeah. They've put me back on between you. Hello. I'm so I'm Hi. sorry. I'm i I'm between you guys now. I mean, That's okay. Uh, you're not, I'm not you're happy not, about it, damn it. On the screen uh, you're not between us. No, well it okay. depends on whose POV it is. My POV That's is fun. between us. Oh, okay. okay. You're between us. Okay. All right. And um, and you know, I was thinking about Bogart myself, you know, from uh, you know, uh, 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 knock on any door. Uh, which made a few dollars, like you were saying, and uh, thus they were able to make in a lonely place. Which the, the the book itself was was very dark, and the main character was a serial killer. The, uh, Dixon Steele was a serial killer, much much worse of a character than you see uh, Bogart portray in in, in the uh, in, in in the in the movie. But uh, so what? You know, they say, well, how far can we go with Bogart? You know, well, he's not going to go back to before 19, till, till, to High Sierra, you know, and, and, and where he's Mad Dog Roy Earl and, 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 you know, he's gunning it down the mountains. Nor is he, you know, going to die at the end like Fred C. Dobbs, which people mm. didn't like either. Uh, so so I, I thought it was I, I thought what you said is most important that they became a symbiotic person, your father and Bogey, uh, and, and probably learned that about themselves in the first movie. Although there was no real uh, connection, I don't think, uh, with the characters, uh, Bogart being growing up in the in the you know the slums and and this, uh, and your father didn't do that. But but even so, I think they found out how to do this next movie, and 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 did that. And 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 of course, uh, what is it? They 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 live by night was his first movie, but it wasn't released till before right before. Uh, uh, in a lonely place, I think it was uh, came out uh, right right 49. before. In a lonely place was the next movie, I think. So right. uh, that's that's pretty wild uh, deal. And I and 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 and, and Peter T. I want to tell you, I love your your toothpick. There's an old <laughs> another Bogart story with uh, Howard Hawks on uh, in, uh, in uh, the one the call, the first one uh, to have and I'm not. And he hired uh, they hired Hoagie Carmichael, Howard Hawks. And it's mm. like, you know, Hoagie Carmichael said, I can't do this. You know, this is too, too important. I have too many lines. There's no way I can do this. And, and Howard Hawks said, you just need one thing. You just need a toothpick for your character. <laughs> and he had the, he had the toothpick and, and, and he got used to that. And he, he came in onto the set. The first time he took the place at the piano, he looked around and everybody on this set had a toothpick. Oh, so that's great. They, they, kind of, they kind of took it from him. And he, he right from there, he was fine. You know what I mean? So it was a great uh, little story for, for uh, Howard Hawk there and Hoagie Carmichael. Became a great actor, I think, because of a toothpick. And I like your use of it as well. Very, It's in a cinematic way. Don't you think, Nika? I do. I do. He's well, I quit smoking like 17 years ago, and I started using these, and I've just never gone beyond them. <laughs> it's okay. Good for you. I'm like 13 years and I'm, I'm with you, you know? Yeah. Yes, anything. <laughs> so we do have the book here, Ray by Ray. Look at that. By and Nico there's some Ray questions. Ray. There's some questions down we below. We have some questions. Good, let's answer yeah. them. You guys answer them. What is the question? Oh, do we do we click on this? Okay, ask the question. Oh, here we go. Uh, was it difficult? For you to write a book on your father. Great chat you guys are having. So was it difficult for you to write a book on your father? Um, incredibly. Incredibly difficult. Um, I had no idea the, um, 
scope of his uh, career or his um, personality. Um, I remember going uh, to the uh, Warner Brother archives at USC, at the USC Cinema Library, and um, they brought six boxes into the room that were just uh, rebel without a cause. Wow. Uh, and it, this was in the beginning of, of my research, and <laughs> I had I had no idea. I just, I had no idea, you know, and, um, you know, so, um, the questions that I needed to answer, um, were far outweighed any kind of difficulty that I came across in, in writing this, in finishing this book. So, yeah. All right, and in case, just in case, Peter, that they were asking it to you, since you've written a memoir, maybe you had to deal with writing about your father too. Was was that hard with the seven tattoos? Is your dad in there? My dad is definitely in there. There um, you go. So maybe they were asking you. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I usurp the conversation? Yeah, I right. it, no, it's no, all, no, it's all you. It's all you. Yeah. It's your night, Nika. So here, here's here's the I'm other not question. My mother, I'm not. Uh, here, here's the other the other question. I love the book. You wrote that you didn't watch many of your father's films until you were an adult. I was just curious if there was any particular re reason you waited until you were older to discover them. Also, do you still have Darby Crash's jacket? So. <laughs> <laughs> who, who asked this question? Um, Chris uh, Ibanez. Uh, Ibanez so. okay. um, uh, no, I don't have this jacket anymore. I, I um, you know, I bought it for eighteen dollars and um, from someone that needed to go cop, and um, uh. And I also felt bad because that jacket was supposed to go to Bosco, who was a musician. I think he played it in this band UXA. But anyway, no, I, I got rid of it in my early 20s. So uh, I don't have that jacket anymore. Um, and what was the other? That's part two. Okay. The other part is uh, you wrote that you didn't watch many of your father's films until oh. you were an adult. Why did so I? You they were, yeah. Why did you wait so long to, to, to till you were older to discover them? Well, because my father was this big, bigger than life. He was just this big um, question mark, and 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 I always wanted to go be with him. Always, I was a da a daddy's girl. You know, but I never got to be one. <laughs> and and when he died, I I was so devastated. So anything to do with him, I had to just uh, you know put him on the shelf. You know, because I had to take care of myself. Um, and that's why I waited so long to uh, see his movies. It just left me, they left me um, longing. And I, mm -hmm. and I, it took a long time for me to be able to um, have that longing exist, coexist with uh, good things. That makes sense. All right. Well, those are the questions that we have. Uh, There's one question on the else? side. Somebody asked Nika if you would read your favorite part about Rebel from the book. Read my favorite part about Rebel? Do you, yeah. Well, well, don't you want to buy the book and, and read? Buy the book. Buy, buy the, the book. book. Tell them to buy the book. There's yeah. a little button there, and you can help keep independent book publishers and booksellers in business. You know, so, you know, it's in the book. So I really suggest that you buy it's the paywall. It's paywall. It's paywall. It's a paywall. good answer. It's a very good answer. 
So, guys, you did a beautiful job, Peter. You were uh, very, very, uh, very good for for Nika. You know, you two were just perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, thrilled. And, and there's Sam coming back. Look at Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Well, that was an amazing conversation and wonderful reading. And if anyone has any other questions, I guess you're just going to have to buy the book and read. And thank you all for being here with us today. Please purchase a copy of Nika's book. And thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, oh, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Thank you Peter. For I was so happy to do this. I mean, really, really honored. I was so honored that you did it, my friend. Well, like, I can't wait till I see you in real time. In real I know, life. right? In real person. In real person. We'll do a part two at Book Soup. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll, wear, I'll wear a mask if I have to. You know, we'll all come. Yes, and then maybe I'll so, read my favorite part of Rebel. Okay, I, great. Yeah. yeah, come back to hear Nika read her favorite part of Reb, about Rebel. Yeah. It, it's too bad we can't take the Santana up the Hudson and see him in Catskill. You oh know? my God, that would be amazing. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, Everyone we'll see you guys time. next time, okay? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Thank Great you. book. Nika, big up. You read a wonderful book. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks for being my friend. Thank you, Peter C. for. And Peter C., you did a beautiful, you made a beautiful book. It's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Well, oh it's like. God. Thank you. That's, uh, That's who I want. That means uh, everything. That means uh, everything to me. You know? Like you guys were who I wanted and you, you saw me and you saw what I wanted to say and you helped get it clear on the page and, and um, you made my dream come true. What can I say? Wow. And you're a part of our dream too. So, you know, we're, we're in that same symbiotic relationship. <laughs> It's plus, plus in the world. Though. It's just, it's creative in the world in, in, in a in a good way, you know. Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, no, thank Thanks. you.